Greetings and welcome back, gentles and ladiesmen, to another exciting episode of Remake or Rebreak. Last time we looked at Banjo-Kazooie on the Nintendo 64 and Xbox Live Arcade. This time we're looking at Banjo-Tooie, the 2000 sequel released on the N64, which was similarly ported to XBLA by 4J Studios in 2009. For the sake of continuity between videos, I suggest watching the previous roar first. So with the first game, Rare's DKC2 team began with Project Dream on the SNES, which eventually mutated into an unreleased 2.5D platformer called Kazoo, and finally rebooted into the Banjo-Kazooie we know today. This time around, the Banjo devs knew exactly what kind of game they wanted to make and how they wanted to expand on Banjo-Kazooie. Bigger worlds, more stages, more characters, more abilities, etc. While Banjo-Tooie was well received at the time, over the years the popular consensus has moved in favor of Banjo-Kazooie being the better game. On my first playthrough of banjo -Tooie, I found myself blown away by the scope of the levels, the expansion of the world building, etc. And this was despite the fact my N64 had an annoying tendency to freeze up without fault after 40 to 60 minutes of play. Despite this, I never had any pressing urge to revisit Banjo Tooie for the next four years, whereas I replayed Super Mario Sunshine and the Spyro Trilogy many times in the meanwhile. When I finally did replay Banjo Tooie via the Rare Replay re release in 2017, I came to the unfortunate realization that the game wasn't nearly as good as I remembered it. Yeah, let me get this out of the way up front. If you were hoping for the grand defense of Banjo-Tooie that exalts it above its predecessor, well, I'm sorry to disappoint. Moreover, given the fact that some people accused me of nitpicking in the last video for pointing out the broken beak bomb mechanic, the clunky egg aiming, the occasionally unhelpful camera angles, and the largely useless pool of combat options, I may very well be signing my death warrant and posting this considerably more critical review. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you love Banjo-Tooie and think it's better than Kazooie, I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever and would compel you to post your own video review and add your thoughts to the marketplace of ideas. Just remember that my purpose as a critic is not to reaffirm what my audience already thinks about a game, but rather to substantiate my own opinions as best I can. As always, I'm committed to giving Banjo-Tooie a fair and balanced review. I'm going to acknowledge both the good and the bad where I find it. Inevitably, some of my criticisms will be a matter of opinion, but reviews are opinional by nature. If you have a problem with that approach, then I suggest you pause this video and watch something else. But this isn't just a review. Much like Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie similarly received an enhanced re-release on the Xbox 360 in 2009, which was later ported to the 2015 Rare Replay collection. Like last time, this is the version I'll be looking at today, given that Digital Foundry shows no significant performance drawbacks and that it's the more accessible way to play Banjo-Tooie XBLA in 2019. As always, Remake or Rebreak is a review segment where I look at the classics of the past and discuss how well subsequent significant re-releases recreate and improve upon the original experience. A reminder that this segment is not just for remakes and has always been a detailed review series from day one. Subsequent significant re-releases include remakes, remasters, reimaginings, and enhanced ports like this game. Meanwhile, cross-platform is for cross-console ports and different games of the same name released in the same generation. So this game does qualify for the segment by my criteria. Anyways, in this review we'll discuss two major questions. First, how well does Banjo-Tooie hold up as a game on its own in 2019? Second, how well does the 2009 XBLA version develop upon the original's foundation? We've got a huge game to cover, so let's hop to it. This is Banjo-Tooie Remake or Rebreak. We begin, as always, by analyzing the plot. At the end of the first game, Banjo and Kazooie successfully defeated Gruntilda the Witch, sending her tumbling all the way down down her mountain lair and becoming trapped beneath the humongous boulder. Despite some robotic shenanigans that took place in between, Grunty's body remained trapped there for two years until one stormy night, when Banjo, Kazooie, Mumbo Jumbo, and Bottles play a game of poker at the duo's home in Spiral Mountain. This scene is comedic gold, with all the characters bouncing off each other really well. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Suddenly, a digging machine busts through the rocky cliffs of Spiral Mountain. The machine's hull opens to introduce Mangella and Blabelda, Grunty's previously unmentioned evil-natured sisters. These two witches combine their powers to destroy Grunty's boulder prison, revealing she's withered away to a skeleton between games. I don't know what's more impressive, the fact that Grunty is still kicking, or that Rare got away with putting this in a rated E game. Mambo witnesses Grunty's escape and tries to warn his friends, only for Grunty to destroy Banjo's house with a gigantic fireball. Although our heroes managed to escape in time, poor Bottles uh, wasn't so lucky. <laughs> That's right, folks. Bottles dies in the first five minutes. All right, I might be getting into the analysis a bit early, but this opening cutscene runs circles around the one from the first game. There's atmosphere, there's tension, there's comedy, and it all caps off with Grunty murdering poor Bottles in cold blood, possibly the most sympathetic character in the franchise. The poor guy can only float there and watch the insects eat his corpse. Immediately afterwards, you meet with Bottles' wife and two children, who wonder when he's coming home. The writers wring dark comedy out of the situation and you feel like an asshole for actually laughing. <laughs> Speaking of which, comedic relief is another highlight of Tui's story. I laughed out loud more times than I could count while playing this game, thanks to the abundance of fourth wall busting and quirky dialogue. Kazooie especially takes her sarcastic nihilism to new heights in the second game, where she only seems to care about people's problems to the extent she gets a jiggy out of it. A nice contrast to Banjo, who remains her comedic foil. The opening once again employs an ongoing symphonic piece that switches between character motifs as applicable. Unfortunately, the 360 version once again struggles to keep the music in sync due to the faster load times. <laughs> It was somewhat tolerable in Kazooie XBLA, but here there are more stings that are meant to synchronize with the action, as well as more fade outs for the music to desync. Given that this was their second port job, you'd hope 4J Studios would have learned from the past and delayed the loading to match the music, but of course not. In my review of Banjo-Kazooie, I discussed the Gruntilda effect, a plot device for motivating gameplay by building up to a showdown with a compelling antagonist the player loves to hate. Banjo-Kazooie used this effectively, with Gruntilda kidnapping the likable Tootie, setting up a bunch of obnoxious progression gates, and making fun of you as you explored her lair. Meanwhile, Gruntilda and other in-game characters provided additional background to flesh out Grunty as a universally contemptible person. By the time you reach the top of her lair, rescuing Tootie becomes an afterthought compared to getting even with Gruntilda herself, and nothing was more satisfying than watching Grunty tumble to her doom. Gruntilda reaches a new low in killing Bottles and widowing his family, but Tootie continues to ratchet up the tension when Mangella and Blabelda unveil the Big O Blaster. This machine has the power to extract life force from all living things, and they plan to use it to create a 
new body for Gruntilda. The witches immediately test it out on King Jingling, a sympathetic character our protagonist just met, turning him into a brainless zombie. As if that wasn't enough, even though Grunty only needs to absorb a few more people to make a new body, she decides to blast the entire island just because she can. Fortunately, the cannon needs to charge up first, a much better ticking clock than the beauty swap machine from the first game. Meanwhile, Klungo, an underdeveloped character from the first game, returns for three boss fights. Each time Klungo fails, Grunty beats the crap out of him off screen, so we can add workplace abuse to the list of the witch's crimes. At this point, the player's motivation to reach Cauldron Keep, avenge bottles, disable the B.O.B., and get even with Gruntilda is at an all-time high. Unfortunately, the tension gradually fizzles from here for a number of reasons, starting when Grunty's sisters order her to stop rhyming her speech? What, were the writers too lazy to think up more rhymes and just gave up? But that's the least of our problems. A cornerstone of the Gruntilda effect is a ratcheting up of tension against the antagonist. Like I said, sometimes the player needs to be reminded what they're fighting for and why. Otherwise, they'll forget and stop caring. And it's pretty hard to keep building up to the climax when your villains largely disappear from the game after the opening sequence. Unlike the first game, there's no game over sequence to showcase what happens if the villains succeed in their plans, nor do we witness the B.O.B. gradually reach full charge to intensify the ticking clock as you play stages. Despite Tui taking pains to introduce Mangella and Blabelda as secondary antagonists, they're more a tool to move the plot along than characters per se. They serve the narrative by freeing Grunty from her boulder prison and introducing the B.O.B., and disappear from the plot not a second sooner. When they do finally reappear in the climax, Grunty promptly kills them off during the quiz game. That's right, they don't even get a boss fight. Grunty herself, who used to regularly chime in via text box to insult the player or brag about how great she was, rarely appears outside of the occasional minigame where she has nothing interesting to say. Kazooie cleverly furthered the Gruntilda effect by having Grunty set up progression gates in her lair that required you to run around collecting useless crap. Rather than blaming the game designers for gating their progress, the player's contempt is thus redirected at Gruntilda, motivating the player to push forward in the hopes of reaching Grunty and exacting vengeance. Progression in Tui, meanwhile, involves unlocking new abilities to explore the Isle of Hags, the game's hub world. You unlock abilities by giving music notes to jam jars and stages, which you open by bringing Jiggies to the Temple of Jiggy Wiggy. It's the same as the first game gameplay-wise, but if anything, it makes you hate Jiggy Wiggy for not just opening all the doors to begin with. Does he want Grunty to zombify every living thing on the island? I appreciate the ways Tui expanded the BK universe with the Jinjo Village and Jiggy Wiggy's Order of the Crystal Jiggy, but from a Ludo narrative standpoint, the designers really misunderstood what made the progression system from the first game work so well. To top it all off, Banjo-Tooie is much longer than the first game, especially for a first-time player, and there are no story updating cutscenes past the first hour. By the time you reach Cauldron Keep, you don't really care about Grunty, the B.O.B., or even Bottles anymore because the plot has been on the backburner for so long. Simply cutting back to the villains once in a while would have made all the difference. Moving on, let's discuss the visuals. As I argued last time, Banjo-Kazooie's use of solid colors for character models and more detailed textures than average on N64 helped that game shine above the rest in 1998. Rare continues this approach for the 2000 sequel while ratcheting up the fidelity even higher. Banjo-Tooie features double the cartridge space of the first game and puts that to use with some impressive graphics for the Nintendo 64, all without the use of the 4 megabyte expansion pack, I might add. From the undersea ruins of a Atlantis to the colorful islands of Cloud Cuckoo Land, this game employs colorful, immaculately detailed textures that avoid the smeary, drab look of other games on the system. Like many rare games, the system's bilinear filtering is put to good use to imply more detail in the low-res textures than actually exists. Many of the models really impressed me, particularly the bosses. Weldar, the Stomposaurus, Old King Cole, Lord Wu Fak Fak, and Target Zan can pass for early PS2 models, they look so good. Once again, the unique vision 
visual design grants these low poly models a lasting artistic appeal they'd lack otherwise. Unfortunately, Banjo Tooie's excellent visuals come with possibly the worst frame rate I've yet experienced on the N64. I've heard that this is a problem that varies between regions and even individual carts. Nevertheless, I'm playing a real North American cartridge on a real N64 console and digitizing with the OSSC, and I feel like I'm playing a PowerPoint presentation. Tui wavers from 10 to 15 to 20 FPS at best, and almost never reaches 30 FPS. I can tolerate 20 FPS or a frame drop here and there, but Banjo and Kazooie might as well be wading through molasses for how jittery and sluggish this game feels. That's doubly baffling considering Banjo Kazooie was one of the few N64 games I know to maintain a more or less consistent 30 FPS. This was thanks to the lower than average resolution and use of mip mapping. Oddly enough, Banjo Tooie actually increases the resolution over the first game, going from 286 by 214 to 297 by 226, while also greatly expanding the environments over the first game. On top of that, the game also supports anamorphic widescreen, which actually looks quite good apart from stretching the HUD elements. I personally opted for 4x3 while playing it on my PVM in the hopes of increasing performance, but was surprised to find that the game seems to run equally bad in both modes despite increasing the horizontal FOV. This is all going off just my eyeballs, mind you. In order to load these giant environments on Nintendo 64, Banjo-Tooie reportedly loads only the geometry shown on screen at any given moment. This constant loading bottlenecks the processor, thereby tanking the performance. I've heard mixed opinions about whether the expansion pack would have improved anything, but it doesn't matter because the game doesn't support it in any region. I appreciate Rare's ambition in trying to bring these huge environments to N64, but if they couldn't get them to render at a bare minimum of a consistent 20 FPS, then maybe it's time to scale things back. All I can say is thank God for the XBLA version. The 2008 re-release of Banjo-Kazooie received a host of visual improvements on 360, which all thankfully returned in the TUI port. The resolution has increased to 1920 by 1080 the HUD elements have been reworked with higher resolution assets, mip mapping was pushed farther back so as to become less noticeable, and the billboarded sprite objects were replaced with higher resolution versions that look quite good. Most importantly, the frame rate is a huge improvement over the original, running at a consistent 30 frames per second with no micro stutter or performance issues to speak of. Seriously, it's like playing a completely different game, and that's doubly impressive considering this was a 1080p game on the Xbox 360. Like last time, I should note that the game appears darker in this video than it appears on an actual 360 because I messed up and accidentally sampled the Xbox's full RGB output and limited range and crushed the colors. The actual game looks less like this and more like this. Once again, the Rare Replay version received enhancements on the Xbox One X, notably 4K resolution. I'd say more, but I don't own an Xbox One X, and I believe the patch came out after I'd already recorded all of my footage anyway. But XO, why ask people to watch in 4K if the gameplay isn't actually native 4K? What, you never heard of pixel-perfect upscaling? Would you rather I upload footage that looks like this? Well, I guess I do have some extra cash, and Xbox One Xs are on sale right now. So, I bought myself a gray gold Xbox One X and hooked it up to my 4K capture card. So, how well do the rare replay ports of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie play with Xbox One X enhancements? Pretty darn well, I must say. By my eyes, these games do indeed run in native 4K, but whoever said this game runs at 60 FPS on Xbox One X is a big fat liar. Both games run at a lockstep 30 FPS on Xbox One X with no noticeable drops or stutters, but it's definitely not 60 FPS. Obviously, the HUD elements are proportioned for 1080p and have to be interpolated to fit a 4K frame buffer, meaning they lose some sharpness, but otherwise the 4K in this game looks pretty good. That said, is it worth buying an Xbox One X over? Not really. While the 4K is nice, the difference between that and the original 
additional 1080p output isn't as much of a jump as you'd think. This is an N64 game at the end of the day, and seeing as these games always had 4 times multi-sample anti-aliasing, even on 360, it's difficult to notice the difference unless you're a graphics nut like me. Still, it does look and play well, so if you do have a 1X and a copy of Rare Replay, I say check it out. The only drawback visually is that once again we have the bottom scan line of the image copying to the top, only this time we occasionally have a column of copied pixels on the sides as well. I noticed it, but you probably wouldn't. Moving on to the soundtrack, Grant Kirkhope once again works his musical magic in Banjo-Tooie. While up to his usual standards, I still think this is Kirkhope's overall weakest showing on the Nintendo 64 after Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64. As usual, Kirkhope showcases a technical mastery of the N64's lack of dedicated sound hardware, utilizing high-quality samples that are unapologetically video gamey. The melodies themselves are reasonably catchy and keep your brain going, and like DK64, I found Kirkhope more willing to experiment with atmosphere than in Banjo-Kazooie. However, while I thought DK64 had an overall good balance in that regard, Tui skews more towards atmosphere. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it means that the melodies aren't nearly as memorable as, say, Treasure Trove Cove, Freeze Easy Peak, or Rusty Bucket Bay. It's well known that Kirkhope reworked pieces from the cancelled Project Dream when composing for Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, so perhaps he had already used up all of his best dream material for the first two games. When Tui does nail the right combination of melody and atmosphere, like Atlantis, Witchy World, or Grunty Industries, it's a feast for the years. When it doesn't, you get forgettable tracks like Hailfire Peaks or Terry Dactyland that fail to impress. In the end, it's pretty good, but I'd rather listen to the first game soundtrack personally. Moving on to gameplay, Banjo-Tooie is a complicated beast to review, so let's start with the basics. The controls are fundamentally the same as the first game with some minor improvements. While I thought the camera was pretty good in the first game, you'll recall that the C button still quantized to increments like Mario 64, while switching to a tank camera scheme by holding down the R button. Banjo-Tooie is much the same in this regard, though the R button now swaps egg types. Thankfully, you can still hold the R button to make the camera follow Banjo, but I kept forgetting that I could do this and relied on the C buttons instead. Holding the C buttons will now rotate the camera continuously, though it's a bit slow for my liking. That was a problem with a lot of games around the turn of the generation. One problem I had with Kazooie was that the fixed camera angles and enclosed spaces could sometimes obscure pertinent information. Because Tui lacks such enclosed spaces, I found the camera overall better in the sequel. Another criticism from my previous review concerned combat. Despite having a decent list of combat options, the only particularly effective attack was Kazooie's rat a rap tap with Banjo's slap being virtually useless and the roll move leaving you open to attack afterwards. Tui overhauls combat options by allowing you to use the rat a rap tap from a standstill, as well as offering an improved roll move that takes out enemies in one hit and lets you move afterwards. Furthermore, the combat-focused enemy gauntlets have been removed, relegating enemies to minor obstacles, which I prefer for Banjo, honestly. Enemies also respawn now, which is good for farming honeycombs, but can be annoying sometimes. On that note, lives have been removed, which is good because they don't really belong in collectathons anyway. Eggs in the first game were annoying to aim and essentially required the R button for any accuracy. Tui introduces a spate of new egg types to play with. An egg excellent idea. While the regular eggs still require too many shots to down foes for my liking, the grenade eggs offer a one-hit solution while balancing with the lower ammo cap. The clockwork Kazooie eggs allow you to grab certain pickups in ways the developers didn't intend and offer puzzle opportunities. However, the fire and ice eggs are extremely situational, so I found myself sticking to grenade eggs for regular combat. On top of this, Tui also allows you to aim eggs in first person to hit switches or take out opponents from a distance. Only problem is that this mode uses the same back-ass aiming controls as Jet Force Gemini in Star Fox Adventures. In most games, you let go of the stick and the cursor stays put, but in these games, you have to hold the stick in place, otherwise the cursor will snap back to the center of the screen along with the stick. It's still an improvement over the aiming controls from the original, but if Rare could get first-person aiming right in DK64 the year before, then why couldn't they do that here? The cheat codes involve aiming eggs at these letters on the temple wall, and with these controls, this simple task becomes ungodly annoying. You'd hope that 
4J Studios would feel how awkward this was and replace it with standard aiming controls on XBLA, but nope. Also, once again, there are no camera inversion options for the X-axis, which was a long established standard by 2009. Thus, I suggest unlocking the homing cheat through Heggie's egg shed as soon as possible to pick up the slack. Speaking of which, I ought to address the restored stop and swap feature in the XBLA version. Due to Nintendo revising hardware between games, the original vision for this feature was scrapped at the 11th hour. So in the final game, four of the stop and swap items are now collected inside of Banjo-Tooie itself. Three eggs and an ice key. The first egg unlocks homing shots, the second lets you swing Kazooie like a club, while the third unlocks Jinjos as a playable character in multiplayer. The ice key unlocks a safe with a Mega Globo. Bring this guy to Humba in the Pine Grove and she'll transform Kazooie into a dragon. And of all these, the homing shot is the only particularly good reward. Seeing as the Brigo Bash is nowhere near as good as the Rata Rap Tap or the Roll, the multiplayer is so throwaway, and Dragon Kazooie's fire breath only works from a standstill. So with all the extra eggs from Kazooie XVLA, did 4J Studios add any good new prizes? So long as you have the eggs in your Kazooie save data, Haggy will automatically hatch one every time you speak to her. Yellow grants a gamer pick, the red egg unlocks a BK dashboard theme for your 360, and the light blue egg awards a mystery item that would supposedly be used in Banjo 3. The dialogue for this is just depressing in retrospect. <laughs> Thus, the light blue egg unlocks Stop and Swap 2, and spawns gold, silver, and bronze eggs in place of the ones from the N64 Tui. There are also a handful of secret challenges you can play for additional SNS2 collectibles, ranging from beating all the bosses in 15 minutes from the replay screen, to deliberately dying against said bosses 40 times. There is no indication whatsoever that these challenges even exist, and all the SNS2 collectibles do is unlock machine parts for the Nuts and Bolts DLC. Logs lost challenges. Meanwhile, the green, dark blue, and purple eggs, as well as the ice key, give you the same prizes from the original. So, while I praised Banjo Kazooie XBLA for restoring Stop and Swap as intended, on the Banjo Tooie side of things, I'm left severely disappointed. A gamer pick and a new dashboard? We waited eight years for this? The homing eggs are still the only worthwhile unlockable, and that's only because the aiming controls are so poor. Speaking of first-person aiming, Banjo-Tooie includes first-person shooter sections where Banjo moves around and uses Kazooie to shoot eggs. The catch is that they use a similar scheme as Jet Force Gemini, right down to the terrible aiming controls. Left stick moves like a tank, left and right C strafe, up and down C adjusts Kazooie's angle, R goes into the free aim mode with left stick aiming. It makes sense for the N64 controller, but odds are new players will need time to adjust. Thankfully, the 360 version updates the this with the expected dual analog scheme standard since Halo Combat evolved in 2001. Left stick moves and strafes, right stick aims. Only problem is that they kept those wonderful Jet Force Gemini aiming controls. What shooters have 4J Studios been playing where this kind of right stick movement was acceptable in 2009? If anything, I prefer the N64 controls since at least when I press up and down C, the reticle stays put. As for the FPS sections themselves, they take inspiration from the Doom likes of the mid to late 90s. You move around in these mazes and locate targets, and it's actually pretty fun. What's also nice is that unlike Conker's Bad Fur Day, which kicks off its TPS gameplay by asking you to make precision headshots in a pack of speedy zombies, Banjo-Tooie ramps up the challenge gradually. The first section lets you focus on moving and strafing in a low-stress maze where you locate MacGuffins and fight a simple boss, while the second section introduces a melee attack and asks you to defuse dynamite in a time limit. It's only by the fourth section in Grunty Industries that the game asks you to start aiming accurate shots in a time limit. I enjoyed these sections. In terms of mechanics, I appreciate that all the unlockable moves from Banjo-Kazooie are available in Banjo-Tooie right off the bat, with a host of optional tutorials available for those who need a refresher. While you'd think the designers exhausted the possibilities for Baron Bird combo moves in the first game, Banjo-Tooie offers quality of life improvements and even a few creative new moves. One thing I realized after playing 
playing ukulele again was that it seems like Kazooie was doing all the interesting things, like flying, running fast, and even the rattle rap tap was the de facto attack move. Tui does a much better job justifying Banjo's inclusion with abilities like the grip grab, which would have been very useful in the first game. You can now unlock faster swimming in Spiral Mountain by holding B and A, a godsend for Jolly Roger's Lagoon especially. First person mode is also enhanced with the Amaze Gaze glasses, which allow for more precise aiming in first person. Perhaps the biggest improvement of all over Banjo-Kazooie is that music notes are now permanent collectibles and are used to unlock moves from Jam Jars the Mole. All I can say is thank goodness, because the drawbacks of the score system from last time outweighed the benefits several times over. Banjo-Tooie's biggest innovation is the ability to split up Banjo and Kazooie, an idea I'm very mixed on. The whole concept of Banjo-Kazooie is that these characters are supposed to be more mobile and fun to play as together than they would be separately. Separating them undermines the entire point of the series, and just goes to show how much more fun Kazooie is to play as than Banjo. I don't mind that nearly as much as the fact you can only separate the characters or switch characters while standing on these split up pads or in a swap cloud. You know, I was already annoyed that flying is still relegated to these goddamn flight pads, even when playing as Kazooie on her own, but at least that has the excuse of balancing the platforming sections. In this case, I have absolutely no idea what they were thinking. Why can't you split up or switch at any time by tapping L, a button that goes unused in the final game? Relegating splitting up or switching characters to dedicated pads only serves to introduce unnecessary backtracking for no good reason. Kind of like having to track down swap barrels to switch between five Kongs so they can collect color-coded bananas. One might argue that being able to split up at any time would break certain challenges or allow one character to get stuck in places they can't get out of. But here's the thing, with the right level design that shouldn't even be possible. This criticism may sound minor at first blush, but these split up pads drag progression to a screeching halt. I couldn't tell you just how much of a Banjo-Tooie playthrough is spent wandering around trying to find a place to switch. The thing is, dying will respawn both characters at the last split up pad you used. So eventually I found myself committing suicide constantly just to speed the game up, and that's not what I call good design. None of this would be a problem if I could just split up or swap characters by tapping L. On top of that, Banjo-Tooie has a problem with pacing out new moves, particularly ones that should have been available from the get-go. It feels like the designers wanted to have new moves in every stage, but couldn't actually come up with that many new ideas, so they had to resort to artificially limiting the player instead. Banjo-Kazooie introduced the Beak Buster in the first stage, a ground pound move to activate switches or destroy obstacles. The second game brings this move back, but it's completely useless in Tui. That's because you need to unlock the Bill Drill just to be able to do things you could already do with the Beak Buster in the first game. Sure, the Bill Drill can also unscrew things, but why can't I just use the Beak Buster to destroy rocks and stuff? It's faster and I already have it at the start. The same thing applies to first person aiming. You get the initial unlock in the first stage, but you need two separate upgrades to use it in the air or underwater. Why are these separate upgrades? What's the difference? It's bad enough that splitting up has to be unlocked, but separated Banjo and Kazooie don't even start with basic attack moves. That's right, you have to unlock the ability to hit enemies, and you require another upgrade so that Kazooie can do the same backflip move she can already do when she's with Banjo, which Banjo can do without needing an upgrade for some reason. Do I even need to explain why this is a problem? You also have to unlock the ability to glide. That's right, even at her best, Kazooie still can't fly on her own without the damn flight pads. Kazooie's only other ability is hatching eggs, which is extremely situational and is unlocked too late in the game. Yeah, gotta push that one back one extra stage and introduce backtracking so that we can have a separate unlock for shooting eggs underwater. That makes sense. Now, to give Tui some credit, I do appreciate all the creative ways Banjo can use his empty backpack. He can swing it at enemies, use it as a shield to protect himself against dangerous liquids, hop around across hazards, and even use it as a sleeping bag to restore health. Like I said, Banjo is much better justified as a player character than in the first game, but the fact he can only do these things without Kazooie is kind of the problem. More importantly, Banjo unlocks these moves so late in the game they become underutilized. I also had to pick my jaw up off the floor when I saw how the snooze pack was integrated into puzzles. 
Plains. In the Stomposaurus Plains or the Crusher and Grunty Industries, you have to let unavoidable hazards repeatedly beat you within an inch of your life and then use the snooze pack to heal yourself so you can keep going. First of all, who would ever figure out that this is what you're supposed to do? Second, how is this fun, challenging game design? I thought the snooze pack was just for conveniently healing on the go, not a method for brute forcing your way through unavoidable hazards. Still, nothing boils my blood hotter than the taxi pack. Basically, Banjo uses his empty backpack to carry objects from point A to point B. And you know what that means! Fetch quests! I don't think I need to tell you that fetch quests are boring, but evidently the designers didn't get the memo. Even then, the in-universe logic really falls apart when you stop and think about it for even a second. So you're telling me that Banjo can carry hundreds of feathers, eggs, music notes, and a bunch of globos and jiggies when he's with Kazooie, but he has to be separate and go out of his way to transport these tiny batteries? Yeah, that makes sense. More often than not, you use the taxi pack to transport some dumb NPC from one place to another, which means finding a split up pad somewhere to empty Banjo's backpack, walking all the way to the NPC, commuting to wherever the NPC wants to go, letting them out, and then backtracking to team up with Kazooie again. Was this really the best idea they could come up with for new gameplay in a Banjo sequel? Also, there's no bigger slap in the face and having to taxi pack this styrocosaur to the train because he feels a little sick, only for his identical sister to automatically run to and from the train in Witchy World. Banjo Tooie is inundated with this kind of irritating, arbitrary fiddling about, and I've only scratched the surface in this regard. There are several side quests that involve these caves in Pterodactyland, such as this one where you need to bring food to these starving cavemen. The only place you can get food is Witchy World, but if you try to leave, Grunty will confiscate your food, unless you go through this very specific exit that goes straight to the cavemen. This very specific exit has a gate you can only open from the Pterodactyland side, so I hope you already opened it or you'll have to waste 10 minutes of your life going all the way around to hit the switch and then go back to Witchy World to pick up more food. My point is that this gate shouldn't be here. You can't even get into this entrance without an upgrade from a stage after after Pterodactyland, and there's a caveman guarding the other end, so this gate's only purpose is to waste your precious time on this earth. There's a similar gate in the Blotazan Relic quest, and you can't even get into the rest of Pterodactyland from this side, so why is this here? Also, the first level tasks you twice with slowly tiptoeing across noisy brambles, but you have to hold the stick in an uncomfortable way to do so, and it's agonizingly slow. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Nobody wants to go super slow. It's never fun. As long as I'm complaining about random missions that annoyed me, I seriously wonder if the later rounds of Canary Mary were playtested by an actual human being. The first couple rounds in Glitter Gulch Mine are perfectly playable, but try to win the Cheeto page in Cloud Cuckoo Land and you'll destroy your thumb from all the tedious button mashing. How is button mashing at such a rate that I have to pause the game and take breaks satisfying fine gameplay. At least on N64, I can cheese it with a turbo controller, but just try button mashing on Xbox with these tiny face buttons. Why didn't 4J Studios just remap this to the triggers? I'd use the Xbox's built-in remapper, but you can't remap the X button to the triggers, so the best alternative I had was the D-pad. There is no way this minigame was playtested on 360. Ugh, but I digress. Mumbo Jumbo returns from Banjo-Kazooie and is now fully playable, which sounds awesome until you realize his attack is worthless, his jump barely reaches anywhere, and all he really amounts to is a glorified put key and lock puzzle. The transformations from the first game were essentially the same thing, but at least there was something new in every level. In this case, the designers didn't even create special platforming or combat sections for Mumbo or anything like that. His only purpose is to press switches. What, may I ask, is the point 
point of this. At least when DK64 made you switch between five Kongs, they could all platform, attack, and stuff. If these Mumbo pads didn't exist, would you ever want to play as Mumbo? Mumbo essentially unlocks part of the stage for Banjo and Kazooie, like oxygenating a lagoon so you don't have to worry about the breath meter, using a golden goliath to smash open objects, disabling machinery, activating machinery, making it rain, or resurrecting dead aliens. D don't ask. Here's my question. Why couldn't Mumbo serve as a magic shop where Banjo and Kazooie trade globos for spell books to use at the Mumbo pads instead? After all, each stage only uses one type of spell, so why not? It would cut down on the padding significantly. That's not to mention the fact that Mumbo's house has two floors now for some reason. So you have to waste 10 tedious seconds climbing up the stairs every time you want to switch characters. Thus, much like with the split up pads, I found myself committing suicide as Mumbo so I could respawn at his house and move on with my day. Also, each one of his spells triggers a long, unskippable cutscene. Seriously, you could do your taxes in the time it takes, and you might end up sitting through three of these in any given stage. That's another problem with Tui. Everything just takes too long, and I find that you're not allowed to skip cutscenes or fast forward dialogue nearly as often as the first game. Do I really have to watch the Chuffy train slowly move from station to station every time I use it? Sure, there are some cutscenes you can skip, most notably the Jam Jars tutorials, which is actually an improvement over bottles in the first game. Actually, on that note, I have a quick update after releasing my Banjo-Kazooie video. Also, if someone has already commented about something, you don't have to comment on it again. Alright, so apparently it is possible to skip dialogue altogether in both Kazooie and Tui by pressing LR and B together. It works! But in the case of Banjo-Tui, you have to wait for the character to start talking before you can skip. And there are other times where it just doesn't work. In any event, you can't really blame me for not thinking to try such an obscure button combination when nothing in either game tells you you can do this. Oh wait, if you look at the bottom corner of this very specific page of the Banjo-Tooie manual, that's where you learn about it. If the game is gonna have all this tutorial information inside the game proper for everything else, there's no reason the game shouldn't reveal the button combination for skipping dialogue as well. I'll definitely use this trick when replaying these games from now on, or I would if 4J Studios hadn't taken this feature out in the re-releases. I tried the bumpers, the triggers, swapping X for B, nothing works. You can still skip cutscenes from the originals that were skippable with start or B, and you can still fast forward dialogue which is good enough, but I don't get the logic of removing a feature like this, even as obscure as it was. Anyways, Humba Wumba takes Mumbo's place as the master of shapeshifting magic, and like Mumbo, she also requires a Globo. Transformations work similarly to their debut in the first game. You play as another creature and use their abilities to access areas Banjo and Kazooie couldn't. To shift the tone of this review, these transformations are overall pretty good. They're still glorified keys, but even the least useful ones are more fun to play as than the pumpkin or the walrus. I just wish they weren't so situational, or that I could revert to Banjo and Kazooie without backtracking to Wumba's wigwam. I also think it's supremely redundant to have both Mumbo and Humbo when both characters essentially perform the same function. Just have one or the other. The only time Tui does anything clever with this is in Terry Dactylan, where you can use Mumbo to enlarge Wumba's wigwam and unlock an alternate transformation. But then again, all the daddy T-Rex can do is scare one caveman and press one switch, so what's even the point? God, I sound as negative as Haydox. At least the washing machine is tied to a longer side quest and can access a slew of optional areas. The final transformation is also a cop-out. It's the B from Click Clock Wood, except he can boost and shoot stingers. Woo. Since I can't think of a better time to discuss this, let's talk about the bosses. Banjo-Kazooie only really had three bosses, but Banjo-Tooie ups the ante by including a boss for each stage. While I really do appreciate the effort, the bosses themselves fall into two categories. Too easy to be fun, and too annoying to be fun. You fight Klungo three times, and the first two times you'd have to go out of your way to lose. While the third fight has this annoying move where he spawns clones and you can only attack the real one. Apparently the real one is the one 
that starts moving last, but good luck figuring that out without a guide. Old King Cole is as simple as standing in place and shooting eggs in first person mode, while with the dragons you shoot the corresponding eggs into the cannon and dodge their predictable attacks. On the other hand, Mr. Patch and Lord Wu Fak Fak are ungodly annoying because you have to fly or swim around and shoot targets with the awful first person aiming controls while the boss takes pot shots at you. Simply trying to line up a good shot with these controls and limited ammo is annoying enough, but the bosses tend to move out of the way at the last possible second, which is just aggravating. These bosses could very well have been fun if the aiming controls didn't have to constantly fight you back towards the middle of the screen, but that's just how the cookie crumbles. Target Zan is probably the best of the bunch, being a great tutorial for learning how to strafe and shoot in first person mode, while Weldar has the distinction of being go okay. I appreciate that they tried, but personally I always considered bosses the weakest part of any collectathon, and Tui is no exception. Ah, spoiler alert! As for the final face-off with Grunty, I'm mixed on that as well. On one hand, while the first boss kept arbitrarily jumping from idea to idea with no rhyme or reason, the Hag-1 boss tests one set of skills and keeps ramping up the challenge like a good boss should. Essentially, you dodge an evolving attack set from Hag-1 until Grunty pops her head out, at which point you switch to first-person mode and shoot at Grunty. I also liked how they integrated the quiz gameplay into the boss. Speaking of which, Tower Tragedy is a surprisingly challenging quiz while removing the board game aspect from Fiery Furnace. There's also none of that irritating beak bomb nonsense, and the Jinchinator doesn't show up to cuck your well-earned victory, so in terms of the actual boss design, this is a pretty big improvement. On the other hand, this fight is even longer than the one from the first game, which was already too long. The boss evolves its strategy, yes, but that doesn't change the fact that if you die, you have to replay the entire 10-minute ordeal all over again. There is a cheat to automatic replenish your health bar, but come on. Either have multiple stages with a checkpoint, or keep the one phase an acceptable length. For what it's worth, this is easily the best final boss in the series, but they really overdid it with the length here. Most of my complaints so far have been a series of minor and a couple major inconveniences that add up to something greater. What's not so minor is the stage design, which takes a different approach from Banjo-Kazooie. When comparing Kazooie to Tui, I find that people have a tendency to view Tui's stages as much larger than those of its predecessor, and that generally they prefer the smaller stages from Kazooie. While this perception isn't necessarily wrong in the case of Jolly Roger's Lagoon and Grunty Industries especially, I'd argue argue that size isn't the real reason why these stages take so much longer to beat. Rather, it has everything to do with how Tui structures progression. Looking back at Kazooie, most stages took place in an open sandbox where you could freely tackle Jiggies in any order, provided you had the moves necessary. Gobi's Valley and Freeze-Easy Peak required moves from the other, but that was the most backtracking there was, really. The key word here is pacing. While Banjo-Kazooie was heavily streamlined and kept backtracking to a minimum, Banjo-Tui reneges on this approach. While stages do have the main sandbox area, they all follow the example of Gobi's Valley and including a plethora of side rooms and indoor areas. While the side rooms in Kazooie were small and could be largely completed on a first visit, the side rooms in Tui tend to involve a lot more prerequisites to flush out all the collectibles or connect it in an arbitrary, confusing way that makes stages difficult to navigate. This is made all the more confusing when you factor in playable Mumbo and Humba transformations. For example, let's examine Mayahem Temple. This is is the simplest stage in the game and is the easiest to navigate. We have three moves that can be unlocked with relatively few music notes, but half the level is blocked behind literal progression gates, while the kickball minigame requires a transformation hidden behind the gates. To open the gates, you need to find a globo and use Mumbo to destroy the gates with a statue. Then you need another globo to transform into a stony to get hints from certain NPCs, solve a puzzle, and play the kickball minigame. Certainly it's no Zelda dungeon, but progression in Mayhem Temple is already more complicated than anything in the first game, and it only gets more complex from here. Glitter Gulch Mine is a maze of tunnels and mine shafts that branch and weave into each other in confusing ways, and even the main sandbox is shaped like an S and is difficult to keep track of. Several pathways are sealed beneath bill drill boulders as well as TNT that can only be destroyed with the detonator transformation. Trying to keep track of all these side areas in your head, especially when you factor in the best route for the detonator, will see you wandering the stage like a headless chicken trying 
trying to track down that one TNT barrel you haven't destroyed yet because everything looks the same and it's unclear how anything connects. Factor in mumbo pads and you have even more backtracking to do. While Witchy World is probably the closest to a Banjo-Kazooie stage in terms of structure, even this level gets complicated when you factor in generators only mumbo can activate and a van transformation that can grab certain collectibles and permanently open certain doors. You need the van to get the mumbo, who then activates the dodge dome, only to then need the van again to open the dodge dome minigame. See what I mean? Even though Witchy World is roughly the size of Treasure Trove Cove, you have to spend a lot of time opening arbitrary progression gates within stages just so you can see the whole level. This kind of design is typical and even commendable in, say, a Zelda dungeon, but in a collectathon game where you're encouraged to get 100%, it just slows things down and makes everything take too long. This is also where the game first introduces those oh so lovely split up pads, which add even more backtracking because you can't just split up with L for some reason. Jolly Rogers Lagoon seems simple at first until you realize there's a network of underwater caverns and ruins to explore that don't connect in any coherent way, making navigation awkward and confusing. Terry Dactyland is structured very similar to Click Clock Wood, being a circle with the vertical structure in the center. However, it also sprinkles a network of hidden caverns throughout the stage without signs or anything to help you navigate. Meanwhile, you need Mumbo and Humba to get certain collectibles or open certain areas, and the order you do this is again arbitrary. Grunty Industries is where the game officially derails, in my opinion. Even getting inside this level is a pain in the butt, and requires finding a hidden switch so you can take the train inside. I spent 30 minutes wandering around looking for the switch before I finally broke out a guide, and that's despite having played this game twice before. Then you start playing the actual level, only to discover Grunty Industries is complicated enough to be its own Metroidvania game, with five floors and an outside area, tons of switches that can only be opened from certain sides, tons of going back and forth between Mumbo and Humba to open certain doors and access certain areas. It's just a nightmare, and it really gives Click Clock Wood a run for its money. From here, stages actually get simpler, which makes you wonder why Grunty Industries wasn't the final stage. Hailfire Peak still suffers from Mumbo and Humba related backtracking as well as the stupid split up pads. Cloud Cuckoo Land is actually one of the least frustrating stages to complete because of how open ended and simply structured it is. Even this level has the flotatious creatures, which you need to hatch in advance so that Banjo can use them in a way that's not clearly communicated to the player, as well as these beanstalks, which you have to plant and then switch to Mumbo to make them grow. If you didn't know that this is what you're supposed to do, you're gonna waste a lot of time retreading all of the ground trying to figure out what to do. When every stage in the game is structured this way, it starts to wear on you really quickly. Now, to give Banjo-Tooie some credit, the designers were at least prescient enough to include these warp pads to enable fast travel between parts of the stage and silos to travel throughout the hub world. Unlike DK64, you can travel to any warp pad in a stage from any warp pad. And I do appreciate that these are here. If I had to walk all the way to Mumbo pads with this walking speed, I probably would have thrown the game out the window by now. However, unlike Mario Odyssey, where you can warp to checkpoints from the pause menu, Banjo-Tooie requires you to either backtrack to the nearest warp pad, or just walk straight to your destination. I also don't think there are nearly enough warp pads to go around, and ultimately the warps don't really solve the underlying problem. That being that Banjo-Tooie's levels are structured in an inherently confusing way that makes it difficult to keep track of where you've been, what areas you completed, and which you haven't. Couple that with the fact you can't finish most rooms in your first visit because of Mumbo, Humba, the unlockable moves, or the split up pads, and you're going to be spending a lot of time wandering back and forth, and 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 it's absolutely dreadful. You want to know the worst part? If this game was structured like Banjo-Kazooie, you wouldn't even need these warp pads. It's what you call a band-aid solution. Also, if I'm using these warp pads as often as possible, and it still takes me anywhere from one to three hours to 100% each stage, then that speaks volumes about how discombobulated the progression is in this game. And that's just the backtracking within levels. That's not to mention the collectibles that require moves unlocked in later stages. I made my big spiel about this in the last video, and some people did fight me on it. Your mileage on this backtracking issue will vary, but I can't help the way I feel about it. If you're going to make me revisit a stage I've already played, give me something substantially new to do when I get 
get there, like the expanded tomes and ukulele that add entirely new parts of the stage to play. If all I'm gonna do is grab a few jiggies in five minutes, there's no reason I shouldn't be able to grab them on a first visit. In my opinion, this adds nothing to the experience. However, Tui also has pickups that can only be accessed by finding a secret passage from an entirely different stage. In these cases, which stage do these collectibles even count towards? The level you found it in, or the level you came from? It just adds another unnecessary layer of confusion, makes it harder to keep track of 100% in your head. The overemphasis on backtracking simply kills the pace in my opinion, especially when you compare the game to Banjo-Kazooie. Kazooie nailed a consistent rhythm to its gameplay that makes it fun to replay and speedrun to full completion. Every couple minutes you'd play a quick challenge, grab your jiggy, and move on. It kept the momentum going and makes you feel like you're accomplishing something on a regular basis. Banjo-Tooie, meanwhile, falls down pretty hard due to its overemphasis on backtracking. It feels like it just takes too long to even find a room with the jiggy, let alone play the minigame to unlock one. I'm not kidding when I say I played Grunty Industries for an hour and a half and only found three jiggies. On top of that, it feels like the amount of work you need to put in before you'll earn a jiggy is incredibly inconsistent, ranging from something as simple as shooting a few flies to backtracking across the entire Isla Hags to bring this lost Styrocosaur to his mother, use Mumbo to return this Styrocosaur to normal size, and cart this Styrocosaur by train to a specific Mumbo pad in the hub world so Mumbo can heal him. That last one gave me a rage migraine. How come Mumbo can't use his healing spell in the damn cave like he did for the shrunken dino kid? Why do I need to put the sick dino on a train and cart him off to the cliff top? What's the point? Banjo-Tooie really went overboard on long form side quests like this. Like the time you have to find all of Boggy's kids, or getting the combination to the safe, defeating all the rock nuts, hatching all of Terry's eggs, etc. Possibly the worst jiggy in the game is when you have to bring Mumbo to resurrect this dead alien dad so the kids will spawn in so you can then switch back to BK to drill open their hiding places only to reveal that one of the kids is cold so you need to fly up as Kazooie to roost on her only to find that another kid is dead so you can backtrack to Mumbo's skull and back to heal that kid. After all that hard work, you get one jiggy. One jiggy. And the alien dad has the audacity to complain that you took too long. You know, there's a reason ukulele increased the pagey count to 25 per stage. It was so you could grab pages at a more consistent rate. For the most part, that game also obeys the Banjo-Kazooie design of walk into a room, play a quick challenge, grab your pagey, leave, rinse and repeat. The only stage-spanning long-form side quest I can think of is the time you have to find all the snowmen's hats and return them to the respective owners. And it was just as balls as this alien side quest. Yes, there were some collectibles you couldn't grab on a first visit, but these could easily wait until you unlocked all your moves by Galleon Galaxy and then came back for the expanded stages. If a collectathon game has to have backtracking, I much prefer the way Ukulele handles it. To switch gears for just a moment, I have heard other people argue that Banjo-Tooie is a Metroidvania of sorts, and I'd actually agree. You unlock new moves to access new parts of an interconnected game world. Unlike how Kazooie's stages were just off-road locations in the middle of nowhere, Tui takes great pains to flesh out the Isle of Hags as a cohesive world. Grunty Industries pulls water in from Jolly Roger Lagoon and oil from Hailfire Peaks, Terry Dactyland connects to Mayahem Temple and Witchy World, and the Glitter Gulch Mines can next to Jolly Roger's Lagoon in Witchy World. This interconnectivity makes the Isle of Hags feel like a real place that could exist, and I do appreciate the attention to world building. I'd also argue that Metroidvania games and collectathons do have crossover appeal insofar as they focus on exploration, speedrunning, and full completion. Nevertheless, Banjo-Tooie fails to take notes from the best collectathons or Metroidvanias in crafting its hybrid experience, resulting in a game that tries to be both but succeeds at neither. The 
best Metroidvanias keep the level design concise and give players multiple convenient ways to travel between areas. Banjo-Tooie does offer interconnectivity between stages, but usually it's done so you can pick up one collectible and then immediately go back to the stage you came from. It lacks the graceful design of, say, Planet Zebus and feels much more like SR388 where every area is a self-contained level, almost. Also standard to every Metroidvania game after 1994 is a map system to showcase how areas are connected to each other and keep track of collectibles you've already found. Sometimes it's an overhead map, sometimes it's fully 3D, but no worthwhile Metroidvania neglects this feature. Banjo-Tooie, meanwhile, makes no attempt at a map system whatsoever, and that's a huge problem. Most normal collectathons don't need one because they keep level design simple and confined. Banjo-Tooie stages, meanwhile, are simply too large, too complicated, and have too many side areas to conveniently 100% without a map. Imagine how much simpler Grunty Industries' five floors and puzzle-heavy progression would be with the map to help you keep track of all the batteries and stuff. Seriously, where is the map? On the Collectathon side, Banjo-Tooie is overtly lacking in tools to help you keep track of 100% in each stage. I've complained about the boot-out system in Super Mario 64 ad nauseum, but one thing that game did really well was the hint system. Each power star in the main stages had a name to go along with it, making it impossible to forget which stars you've collected and which you hadn't, with the exception of the castle secret stars. Rocket, Robot on Wheels, and Spyro 3 streamline this feature in the pause menu, informing you of which tickets or eggs you've collected already. Banjo-Tooie, despite having really complicated jiggy quests that often involve backtracking within and between stages, fails to sufficiently refine its inventory system to help players keep track of what they've collected and what they haven't. All you get is a jiggy counter for that stage, which is better than nothing, but extremely unhelpful if you don't know what you're missing. What we needed was an inventory system that tracks jiggies individually, with a unique name to remind you of what you've already done. And guess what? Each jiggy does have a name, but you have to use a secret cheat code and then backtrack all the way to Jiggy Wiggy's temple to see them. Why relegate such a basic, essential feature to an out-of-the-way room when you could just put it in the pause menu? Even then, Jinjo's extra honeycombs and Cheeto pages only have a counter and it's much harder to remember those things, especially since someone decided to include fake Jinjos that respawn and confuse the player. I'm aware that plenty of collectathons and metroidvanias only have counters like this, but if Rare was going to emphasize long-form side quests and puzzle-heavy progression, they needed to include a map and overhaul the inventory system. End of story. Of course, none of this matters nearly as much if you don't care about 100%ing the game and are fine with just beating it like normal. In that sense, Banjo-Tooie actually improves. While Banjo-Kazooie required 94 out of 100 jiggies to fight the final boss, Banjo-Tooie only requires 70 out of 90. So it's entirely possible to skip the annoying backtracky jiggies, most of the Jinjos, Mr. Patch, and Lord Wu Fak Fak, or even the entirety of Grunty Industries and still see the ending depending on your routing. I understand that 100% is something you either care about or you don't. Nevertheless, I'm a completionist and the appeal of collectathons to me has always been about trying to 100% them as quickly as possible through good routing. The Spyro Trilogy minus Ripto's Rage does this well, and Banjo-Kazooie's 100% experience was great minus Click Clock Wood. Banjo-Tooie, meanwhile, is so convoluted and so overstuffed that the thought of 100%ing Grunty Industries alone puts me off from replaying this game. Collectathons don't benefit from long-form side quests and multiple visits. They benefit from concise, focused stage design that's easy to speedrun. You may have noticed I haven't talked about the Xbox Live Arcade version of Banjo-Tooie in a while and, well, what is there to say when there's nothing to say? Fact is, this 360 re-release was the perfect opportunity to fix some of Banjo-Tooie's issues and improve the experience for a modern audience. And while 4J Studios did that well on the visual and performance side, they failed to follow up on the gameplay side. For example, many re-releases will add maps to games that didn't originally include them, like Super Mario 64 DS. Banjo-Tooie absolutely begs for some kind of map feature, but 4J Studios didn't add a map of any kind in this enhanced port. Apparently, they had the time, money, and talent to draw up high-resolution sprites and HUD elements, but they couldn't put together a simple black and white map? Similarly, the Jiggy hints are still locked behind a cheat code and are only readable from Jiggy Wiggy's temple, even though I can't imagine it would be that hard to add these hints to the pause menu. Keep away from those keyboards, gamers, because I have another production update live from the editing room. 
All right, so while I was recording native 4K footage after I got my Xbox One X, I realized that the controls for swimming and flying were inverted opposite what I was used to. So I opened up the options menu to change it and found Jiggy hints. I open it up and sure enough, it's the list from Jiggy Wiggy's temple with a little marker to let you know whether you found that Jiggy yet. In other words, it's exactly what I wanted and I'm happy this is here. Though, I've got to question the decision to hide it in the help and options menu when it really belongs in the totals menu. Moreover, the Jiggy hints option is only available while you're in a stage and will only view Jiggies from that stage. Seeing as most people will change the option in the hub world or from the title screen, it's little wonder it took me so long to find this important feature. Bottom line, thank god this is here, but next time, put it in the totals menu where it belongs anyways. Going back to switching Banjo and Kazooie, you still need to backtrack to a split up pad or find a swap cloud, though at least 4J was nice enough to map this to B instead of X. In that case, why not take it a step further and let the player separate with the left bumper at any time? The only thing this would break is the beans stock and flotatious creatures in Cloud Cuckoo Land, but the stage shouldn't have been built that way to begin with. I could go on, but you get the point. 4J Studios had plenty of opportunities to improve with simple fixes and didn't capitalize on any of them. This is where I'd end things, but I have a bit of a confession to make. As you'd imagine, playing the same game multiple times for remake or rebreak and cross-platform can be as tedious as it is necessary. After all, I try to be as thorough and accurate as I can, and I can't really do that if I don't play the full game. The bright side is that multiple playthroughs of a game for review can highlight things I didn't notice on my initial run. Usually these observations are negative, like how playing Ocarina of Time four times for the roar only cemented how little replay value that game holds for me. Conversely, a back-to-back -back second playthrough of Banjo-Tooie actually left me enjoying the game more. Let me explain. I can play out through Super Metroid reasonably quickly after playing it for 12 years, but I still very vaguely remember my first playthrough in 2007. I sucked, and every once in a while I had to break out a guide to figure out where to go. I distinctly remember getting my ass kicked in Ridley's hideout and having to backtrack for energy tanks. My point is that first playthroughs can be brought down by player error just as much as bad design, and sometimes a second playthrough with prior knowledge can be transformative. The problem with Banjo-Tooie is that a 100% playthrough will take the first time player so long that it could very well put them off from replaying the game altogether. According to my original N64 save file, it took me 30 hours to 100% Banjo-Tooie in my first playthrough in 2013. My second run in 2017 cut that down to 22 hours, while my N64 run for this review cut that down to 17. Stages still took me 2 hours on average to fully complete, including backtracking. I plowed through Banjo-Tooie on XBLA immediately after my N64 run in just shy of 10 hours. Yeah, I was floored. After all all the senseless frustration I endured in my N64 run, I was shocked at how much faster the game becomes when it's fresh in your mind. I could remember to do stuff like load the Styrocosaur kid onto the train during my first visit to Witchy World, or where to find all the TNT barrels in Glitter Gulch Mine, or how to open the back entrance to Grunty Industries, etc, etc. Granted, a second playthrough didn't help much with mumbo pads or split up pads, but I could at least remember details like where all the batteries were and where to take them and where all the skivvies were. Yeah, Grunty Industries especially was a lot faster the second time around, so credit where it's due, I shaved off almost 8 hours of playtime simply through prior knowledge, so I can understand if more experienced players were surprised at how long it took me the first time around. So if that's the case, then why did I spend so much of this review ragging on Banjo-Tooie's backtracking and stage design? While it is true that the game becomes faster when you know what you're doing, I'd still argue that Banjo-Tooie should have never been designed this way to begin with. Mumbo Jumbo didn't need to be playable if all we were going to do was press a switch and then immediately switch back to Banjo and Kazooie. And we certainly didn't need Humba Wumba on top of that. Levels didn't need to have such a rigid progression structure when the first game was better off without that. We didn't need extensive long form side quests that span multiple stages and take hours to complete for one jiggy. We didn't need fake Jinjos to confuse the player. We shouldn't have had to unlock basic attack and 
platforming moves for separated Banjo and Kazooie. And more importantly, there's no reason why Rare had to relegate splitting up to special paths, nor is there any excuse for the lack of a map feature. Fact is, if I wasn't reviewing this game for Remake or Rebreak, I probably never would have played Banjo Tooie twice in a row like I did, and I doubt most casual players will either. Which brings us to our conclusion. While I do believe there is a good game buried in here somewhere, Banjo-Tooie ultimately crumbles under the weight of its own overambition. As the great TGX once said, if you succeed at what you set out to do, then there's no fault in being overly ambitious. But if you fail, then, well, you failed. While I wouldn't go so far to call Banjo-Tooie a failure, per se, I will say that very little of its risk-taking really pays off. And that's a damn shame, because as a sequel, Banjo-Tooie does have a lot of good things going for it. Most of my criticisms of the first game have been fixed here, including a better camera system, permanent music notes, better combat options, better egg controls, faster swimming, and the list goes on. The opening story sequence kicks off the game with a bang, and I really do respect the Banjo team for attempting such large environments on the N64. Unfortunately, from Mayahem Temple onwards, the game declines significantly. Whether it's the clunky first-person aiming controls, the mediocre boss battles, poor communication on the game's part, and consistent pacing for jiggy quests, or a frame rate worse than the SNES Star Fox games. That's not to mention the level design and backtracking issues I've thoroughly dissected at this point. While the story starts strong, a dearth of cutscenes in the middle of the game causes the tension to dissolve to the point I lost interest by the end. There's also a multiplayer mode, which I didn't even mention because there's nothing to mention. You get a choice of the FPS sections, mine kickball, or collecting twinklies in the Dodgem Dome with up to four players. It's okay, but it feels like it was shoehorned in at the last minute. I may not have cared about Conker's multiplayer, but that at least had more effort put into it. Speaking of which, that's another thing the XBLA version falls down on. There's no online multiplayer as far as I know, but for some reason every player requires an Xbox Live account for local multiplayer. If you try playing with a guest account, the game will boot you back to the title screen. At the end of the day, I prefer Banjo-Kazooie over Tui not because Banjo-Kazooie is a perfect masterpiece that can never be topped, and you'll recall I spared no criticism in my last review. Rather, I prefer Kazooie because all the ways Banjo-Tooie tries to evolve the formula ultimately makes for a weaker game in my opinion. That just leaves us with one last question. Remake or Rebreak? How well does the XBLA re release, recreate, and improve upon the original experience. While I appreciate the improvements we did get, the best I can give Banjo-Tooie on Xbox 360 is a remaster. I reserve this score for a relatively competent, playable recreation that boasts some improvements but still falls short of expectations. Like the previous port of Banjo-Kazooie, 4J Studios cleaned up the graphics by up to 1080p, replaced the billboarded sprites with higher resolution textures, and updated the HUD with HD assets. More importantly, the game runs at a flawless 30fps without any micro stutter or performance issues to speak of. Furthermore, as I discovered while editing this review, there is indeed a comprehensive screen to track Jiggies individually, which is an important and necessary improvement over the N64 version. However, 4J Studios had so many chances to improve the gameplay and squandered each and every one of them. Where is the map feature? Why is splitting up or switching characters still tied to split up pads? Why does the first person aiming still use the Jet Force Gemini system, both in and out of FPS sections. Seriously, why are these controls in a 2009 game? Why does local multiplayer require Xbox Live? Why was the LRB cutscene skip removed? While I praise the restored stop and swap in Kazooie XBLA, the payoff in Tui XBLA was unimpressive to say the least. Like, gamer picks? Is that really the best they could come up with? Frankly, if it weren't for the better frame rate, I would have rated this a reprise in an instant. This re-release might be lacking in improvements, but if the alternative is playing the game in 10 FPS on N64, I'd still rather stick with this. Bear in mind that the port of Banjo-Kazooie also lacked gameplay improvements, like a reticle for the Beak Bomb or signposting progression in Grunty's Lair, and I similarly criticized 4J Studios for this in the last video. Nevertheless, that version at least fixed the original's biggest gameplay flaw, the music note system. That was enough to bump it up from a remaster to a remake for me. The port of Tui, meanwhile, fails to make a series of common-sense 
improvements and thus fails to pass the bar for the remake tier. The point of re-releasing a game is to reevaluate what it did well and what it didn't and update it accordingly. And I don't feel like 4J Studios did nearly enough. But you guys get the point. Join me next time for a cross-platform of Banjo-Kazooie, Grunty's Revenge for Game Boy Advance, and mobile phones. If you liked today's review, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing for more. You can also find me on the Unverse cast, where I meet up with Hadox, Ryrule, and King K to talk about video games and read bad fan fiction. What is, Michael's what is the rapper's actual name? Big Nasty? What, what is it? Big Nasty? What? what? Big <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> Big Nasty? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's like a thing in the news where Kanye West is using his connections with the president to help free some rapper who got jailed in Sweden. What? No, he. The funnier thing is Michael called him Big Nasty. <laughs> the fuck? It's ASAP Rocky. <laughs> Big Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are like the whitest person ever. Oh my gosh. Is that the, the rapper named Big Nasty? <laughs> I hear my kids talking about him. <laughs> you can find video versions of the podcast on YouTube and an audio version on SoundCloud and iTunes. I also have a Let's Play channel, EPG Plays, where I offer informative playthroughs on games I like and some I don't. It's also the new home of Zebro's Play, sillier playthroughs I do with my brother. <laughs> Man, am I lucky or what? Or am I just cool? Oh, you say you need a crystal star, Lord Crump? Boom! Falls right in my lap. Still, this is humiliating. You should have been able to escape that cell. So for insulting my awesome trap, I'm gonna repay you with a little present. Know what it is? Oh, just a little something I like to call a remote time bomb detonator! I'm gonna use this to bury you in those squirmy puties and rubble. Sound fun? Well, enjoy your final minutes inside this dank old tree. And with that, pow, I'm gone. Be sure to go check those out. Until next time, I'm Exaparadigm Gamer, and I hope you enjoyed the review.